Right, hello. Uh, I'm Ed Siegel. Um, so I'm, I'm the third speaker, so I'm talking for this week. How's, how's it been going so far? Has it been all right? You can be honest, I won't tell them. <laughs> They're working you hard, right? I'm impressed, all these exercises. Right. Um, yes. And this very nice chalk. Um, and I come from UCL in London. It may say Imperial somewhere, but I'm not there anymore. I'm at UCL. Um, and I don't really have a title, so let me make one up now. Windows, etc. Um, so the point, so I'm going to be giving four lectures this week. Um, and it sort of ties in with Nick's lectures, but to start with, we'll be saying quite different things, and then the aim is we tie it together at the end and, um, and prove some things. So unless everything goes wrong, these lectures will converge. Um, so the idea I'm going to be talking about is um, basically what happens when you have a space which is a quotient of another space by a C star action. Right, so suppose you have some, some variety which is built by taking a bigger variety and letting C star act on it um, and then quotienting in some sensible way. And then what you want to do is you want to understand the derived category of X and the point is to try and do this by thinking instead about the space Y and the C star action built into it. But the question is basically, can we try and understand the derived category of X? This thing that you've been learning about all week. Um, so what would be the basic example? Well, what about projective space? So if I look at CPN, then we know that that's built by just taking C to the n plus 1, and quotienting by rescaling. Well, maybe not quite. You have to delete the origin as well. Um, and of course, you know that if you're going to do geometry on projective space, that's almost the same thing as doing geometry on C to the n plus 1 but remembering that you have to, everything has to be invariant under rescaling, right? So projective variety is almost the same thing, it's just a cone in C to the n plus one, something that's invariant under rescaling. Um, so that's sort of almost true, but not quite, right? It's a projective variety is not exactly the same thing as a cone, because the difference is you have to throw away the origin, right? So geometry here is almost geometry here, but not quite. Right? So geometry on P to the n plus 1 is approximately equal to C star equivariant geometry on C to the n plus 1, but not quite. And kind of the point of my next few lectures is, is to just get to grips with this bit on the level of derived categories. So what, is, what does this but not quite do when you think about derived categories? So the point is to compare two things, the derived category of the space you're actually interested in, x, the quotient space, and the derived category of y, but equivariantly. So something called the equivariant derived category of y, which I'll talk about a little bit in a minute. Um, so that's, that's the thing that we're going to be talking about. And the payoff, the point of doing this, really, um, is partly just to understand the derived category of x on its own, but more importantly, it's because sometimes there are two different spaces coming from the same Y. So sort of the point of this 
is sometimes um, have different choices of quotient. Starting from the same data of y with a c star acting on it. The trouble is that taking quotients in algebraic geometry is a little bit subtle, and sometimes there are choices to be made in the subtlety, and those choices can result in different possible spaces. Right? Um, what I'm not really going to talk about is geometric invariant theory, but if you've heard of geometric invariant theory, that is what I'm referring to. Um, but we'll just do everything very explicitly, and you'll see what I mean with the different choices. Um, and then the point is that if you can compare both of these guys to the equivariant derived category, then you can compare them to each other. So the output is that you get to compare the derived category of x1 and the derived category of x2. And you can do things like proving that two different varieties have the same derived category, right? Which is a slightly surprising thing, because the derived category is a very rich and complicated thing. And to discover two distinct spaces that have exactly the same derived category is, is somewhat surprising. Right? It's not something you should take lightly. So this is a very active field of research, is understanding when it's possible for two different varieties to have the same derived category. Um, but we're not actually just going to be interested in equality. Sometimes we'll see that the categories are different, but maybe different in a very controlled way, some semi-orthogonal decomposition or something like this. So maybe one thing I'm, I'm slightly overselling is that I'm talking in, in the abstract about taking some space y, but actually, for us, y is just going to be a vector space. So y is just going to be like c to the n. But it can be done more generally, but you know, we're going to start with the simple situations. Um, and so the technique that we're going to use um, is the thing that's referred to in my title, which is about windows. So the technique um, is to use something called windows, um, also known as grade restriction rules. So this is a technique, so <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm gonna be massively self-promoting, I would say that this is a technique which uh, I invented about 10 years ago um, in a paper I wrote, I think it was in 2008. Um, and I actually, well, the first admission is that I didn't invent it at all, I stole it from some physicists. So I read about it in a string theory paper um, by um, Horry, Herbst, and Page a little bit earlier. Um, so this is connected to string theory, but I'm sorry, I'm not gonna say anything about string theory. Well, okay, 90% of you will be happy I'm not gonna say anything about string theory, and sorry to the other 10%. Um, but even then, that's, that's sort of lying, because really this is just a retelling of, of mathematics, which is considerably older, and due to lots of people, so um, really it's older, and it's due to, um, so Balenson, whose name I'm sure you've heard last week, um, and then various other people, Kawamata, uh, Michelle Vandenberg, so I'm going to basically tell you some, some old maths from a slightly different perspective. I mean, I guess from your point of view, things that were done in 2008 is old maths already, right? Is that definition of what cl classical in mathematics? Classical means it was written before you started your PhD. So this theory is classical. Um, okay. So let me tell you. Let me tell you the plan. So you'll know what what this what these lectures were meant to be about, whatever they end up being about. Um, so the first thing I want to do, which is probably going to take most of today, um, is Really, you just do projective space again. Um, so you did Balenson's theorem, right, last week. Balenson's theorem about this exceptional collection of line bundles on projective space. We're going to do it again, I'm sorry, um, because we're going to just tell it in a slightly different way. 
So we're going to do the Balanson theorem for projective space again from a, from a slightly different perspective. Um, and then we're going to do some related examples, or at least one example. Um, and then probably most likely tomorrow, we're going to move on to the bit which I said was kind of the point, which is to look at situations where you have more than one possible quotient, and you can compare them. So we're going to do some examples um, where different quotients exist. Um, and the absolute key example here, which we're going to talk about a lot, is called the Atia flop, which hopefully some of you have heard of already. Um, so this bit, I'm fairly confident we're going we're gonna to do. And then the sort of the second part is where we connect up with next lectures. So um, I'm just going to talk about derived categories for the first two or three hours, but then we're going to we're going to talk about matrix factorization. So we're going to take the techniques we have used for derived categories and generalize them um, to study categories of matrix factorizations. Um, and as a payoff, um, we're going to prove a very nice theorem by Orlov, um, which relates derived categories of varieties, specific varieties, with certain categories of matrix factorizations. So you can compare the derived category of an honest space with some slightly more weird category of matrix factorizations. But this is kind of an interesting point of view. Um, and it's what physicists call the Calabi-Yau Landau-Ginzburg correspondence. That makes it sound exciting, though. Calabi-Yau Landau-Ginzburg. Correspondence. Um, and Nick told me he talked last week a bit about some interesting semi orthogonal decompositions you get. Like if you throw away some exceptional line bundles and see what's left. So the point is that what's left over can be described as a category of matrix factorizations. So we, we're going to fit together everything that we've done. So this idea of comparing different quotients and then doing it with matrix factorizations, and all of this is going to lead, lead to this situation where you can compare that you can get semi-orthogonal decompositions with derived categories of varieties and categories of matrix factorizations fitting together. Um, so we'll see some semi-orthogonal decompositions involving matrix factorizations, and derived categories. OK, I hope. That's, that's, I hope that that's where we'll get to by the end. That's the idea. So I just arrived from London at like 10 o'clock last night, so you have to bear with me if I'm a little bit vague. <laughs> My body is not convinced that it's not like, whatever it is, midnight or something. OK, so yeah, with that in mind, I'm going to start very gently <laughs> for everyone's benefit. Um, so we're going to do Balenson's theorem again. That's the idea. See a bunch of things that you've, you've all seen at least last week, if not before, but just told in a, in a slightly different point of view. So. Let us take C to the n plus 1 and equip it with its normal standard C star action acting by rescaling. Um, on the level of rings, of course, I'm just saying that I take a polynomial ring, which I'm going to call R, that's polynomial in n, pl n plus 1 variables. And the effect of lambda is to send a monomial to lambda times that monomial, right? Um, and if you're a degree d monomial, you get multiplied by lambda to the d. Um, and 
something that's probably very familiar is that saying that I have a ring with a C star action on it is just saying that I have a graded ring. Right? If you have C star acting on a ring, then you just look at the decomposition of the ring into weight spaces for that C star action, and that gives you the pieces of a grading. Right? So IE R is a graded ring in the usual way. Um, okay, so now I'm going to look at sheaves on C to the n plus 1, and I want to make them equivariant with respect to this C star action. Well, let's just start with ordinary sheaves, right? Coherent sheaves on an affine variety, that's the same thing as modules over the ring, right? Um, we want to make it equivariant. So let's say we have a C star equivariant sheaf. Well, that's the same thing as choosing an R module and then putting a C star action on it. So it needs to have an action of the ring R and then it also has to have an action of C star. And then there's some compatibility because the ring R has a C star action on it, and the module has a C star action on the module. And you want those two things to fit together in a sensible way, which I'm not going to bother to write down. So plus some compatibility. And again, putting a C star action on a module is the same thing as putting a grading on the module. You split the module up according to the weights of the C star action, that tells you that it's graded. The compatibility tells you that the grading on the module plays properly with the grading on, on R. So all I'm saying is that this is an R module. Oh, sorry, all I'm saying is this is a graded R module. I'm hoping that all of this is completely obvious to all of you, and I'm just starting simply because things are going to get slightly more complicated in a minute, and I didn't want to lose you straight away. Okay, so C star equivariant sheaves on C to the n plus 1 are nothing weird. They're just graded modules of a pol polynomial ring, right? And that forms an abelian category, okay? So if I write C star equivariant coherent sheaves on C n plus 1, that's the category of graded R modules, and it's an abelian category. So it has a derived category because every abelian category has a derived category, and that is the equivariant derived category. I'm going to write it like this. The equivariant derived category of Cn plus 1. That's usual. That means of coherent sheaves on Cn plus 1. And that is nothing more than the derived category of graded R modules. OK? So equivariant derived categories are not anything weird. That's the point of all of that preamble. Um, okay, so let's point out some really obvious objects that we have in this category. Well, what if we took R itself? That's an R module. It's a graded R module. So this is an object inside uh, graded R modules. And if you want to think of it instead of an, as an equivariant coherent sheaf, then of course it's just the structure sheaf on C to the n plus 1. Um, slightly more interestingly, you could take a shift in the grading. So you could take R but shift it along by 1, so all the pieces that were in degree 0 now move to being 
thing in a different degree. And that gives you a new graded R module. And that corresponds to some equivariant coherent sheaf on C to the N plus one. So one way to think about what this is, is that you've taken the trivial line bundle and you put a C star action on it and the C star action is not trivial. C star action is acting by some character of C star and the character it's acting by is the dth character, right? So it's acting by taking lambda to the d. Right, of course, technically it's much simpler just to think about the graded R module. Um, what happens if you take morphisms between these guys? Well, it's the same as taking morphisms between R modules, but you only want to take out the things of degree zero. Right? So homomorphisms between R and R to the D, say, is the same thing as well. Equivariant homomorphisms from R to R to the D. Now the homomorphisms from R, if you took all the homomorphisms from R to R to the D, you'd get the whole of R, but you just want to take out the equivariant ones, which means the things of degree zero, and because you've done this shifting in there, you're actually picking out the things in R of degree D. which is the polynomials of degree D. Okay, so that is completely trivial working on this category. So part of the reason I'm laboring this is I, I wanna convince you, if you're not already convinced, that this category is very easy to work with. Right? It looks a bit weird because you're saying equivariant derived category, but actually you're just talking about graded R modules and things are very straightforward when you're talking about graded R modules. But we don't really want to do this category. We want to do projective space. So we want to throw away the origin. So I want to look at projective space and you get that by taking CN plus one, throwing away the origin and then quotienting by C star, right? So I wanna do the same thing again, but I wanna work not on C to the M plus one, but on this space here, C to the M plus one with the origin thrown away. Now, that is not an affine scheme anymore, so you can't just say sheaves on that guy are modules. You're gonna have to sort of split it up into affine pieces and put modules on each piece. Um, but still, still it's not too bad, right? You can hopefully see how you can define the C star equivariant sheaves on this thing, okay? And the basic fact, which is gonna make all of, all of the rest of the story depends on is that looking at coherent sheaves on projective space is exactly the same thing as looking at C star equivariant coherent sheaves on C to the M plus one with the origin deleted. This is really important to believe this. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not, you're not gonna be happy about anything that I say for the next three and a half hours. Um, I put it as exercise one on my problem sheet. Um, but you know, this is not the sort of thing that it's worth hammering out every detail of the proof, unless you're really that kind of person. But it's important that you really, are, you really do believe that this is true, okay? Coherent sheaves on PTN are literally the same thing as equivariant coherent sheaves on C to the N plus one but slightly different from equivariant coherent sheaves on the entire space because of this deleting of the origin. But if I give you 
an equivariant sheaf on the whole space, on all of C to the n plus one, then I could just throw away the origin and I'd have a sheaf on, on the remainder, right? So what we have is, is a restriction functor from equivariant coherent sheaves on the entire vector space. I'm going to call it, uh, I think, rho upper star, pulling back uh, along the inclusion to equivariant coherent sheaves on c to the n plus 1 minus the origin. You take your sheaf and you just look at it on the open set that you get when you delete the origin. Another way to say this is that this is graded R modules and that this is coherent sheaves on projective space. And this operation you may have come across before, it's normally called proj. Right, the proj functor takes graded modules and spits out sheaves on projective space. All that functor does, all it's doing is just restricting to the open set where you throw away the origin. So it's a very straightforward functor. So, for example, you could take the graded R module given by R with its degrees all shifted away, and you could restrict that to the complement of the origin, what are you going to get? You're going to get a line bundle, right? Because it's locally, it's locally free rank one. So it's going to still be locally free rank one over here. So it's going to give you a line bundle on PN. And what line bundle is it? Of course, it's OD on PN. Um, and just so I confuse you less later, I mean, when I'm talking about sheaves on this vector space, I can talk about them in this notation. I can say this thing is RD, but very often I'm just going to say, well, this is just the structure sheaf twisted by D. So I might just say that this is OD, but considered on, on CN plus 1. And then, of course, I restrict it, and I still have OD, but now it's on projective space. I will probably use this notation more, which is the only reason I'm telling you. Um, now, this, what I've just said, is a function between two abelian categories. So we want to do derived categories, so we should derive it, right? But we don't have to, because all we've done is restricted to an open set. Restricting to an open set is exact. So without doing any work at all, you get a functor on the level of derived categories from the derived version of coherent sheaves on the vector space to the derived category of PN. There is no derived version of proj. You'll be happy to hear. OK. So. Now, now we're in a position to, to address the point of this talk, which is what happens, what is the but not quite that I overlined over there? What is it that changes when you go from thinking about sheaves on the whole of, a whole of CN plus one to thinking about sheaves just on PN? Okay, this functor is not an equivalence. These two categories are different. So what's the difference? Well, one way to say what the difference is is that on the whole vector space, it's an affine variety, and therefore sheaves don't have any cohomology. Right? Yeah. Yes.
So something un uncontroversial is that if you're on an affine, affine variety, then sheaves have no cohomology because the global sections functor is just the identity functor, so it doesn't need any deriving. Um, what if I work equivariantly? I have to be very slightly more careful. Um, well, there's again a sort of global sections functor. If you take an equivariant coherent sheaf, um, there's a, a, a thing that you could call global sections which is the homomorphisms from the structure sheaf to an object, because that's what global sections is. Um, so that spits out a vector space. And what does that do? Well, it takes your graded module and it takes out the degree zero piece, right? Or if you like, it takes out your, your equivariant module and it takes out the invariant part of it, right? So M goes to M0 equals the invariance. That functor is exact, which is a slightly more delicate statement than the first statement because it depends on us being in characteristic zero. Right? Taking invariance in, in finite characteristic is very much not exact, um, but characteristic zero for the group C star, at least taking invariance is exact. So again, in this sense, sheaves have no cohomology. Take their global sections, it's an exact functor, you don't have to derive it. Um, of course, on projective space, um, things are rather different. Um, oh, hang on, let me, let me write one more thing. Um, suppose I want to know the x groups um, in this equivariant uh, version of the derived category between um, O and OD. Well, that's just going to be, as usual, the kth cohomology of OD, and that's going to be zero if K is positive in the equivariant derived category. All I'm saying is that if you look at the functor that computes HOMs from O to OD in this category of equivariant sheaves, that, as I just said, is taking invariance. It's an exact functor, so it has no higher derived functors. So all of these higher derived functors are going to vanish. Right? But on projective space, of course, that's not true. Sheaves do have cohomology. And some of the things I've just written down would not be zero anymore. If you take the nth x group between O and O minus n minus 1, that's computing the cohomology of O n minus 1, and that's going to be C. Something I really hope they drilled into last week, if you didn't, if you didn't have it already inscribed on your heart, is what the cohomology groups of line bundles on projective space are. Right? This is the fundamental fact about algebraic geometry. <laughs> the hn of this guy is equal to c. OK? So x groups have changed. When we pass from these sheaves on the whole vector space to sheaves on pn, some of the x groups have changed. But the x groups are the morphisms in the derived category. 
right? So the morphisms have changed. So that tells you this function is not an equivalence. So this function from the derived category, uh, the equivariant derived category of C to the n plus one to the derived category of Pn is definitely not fully faithful. Because the morphisms between these two objects changes according to which category you compute them. Um, another way to say this, whenever you have, wait, maybe I'll back that up again. But another way to say this is, this functor has some kernel, this row star thing. So another point of view is that row star has kernel, right? There are objects which go to zero, and what are they? They're the objects which are supported at the origin, because you threw away the origin. If I look at O0, the skyscraper sheaf supported at the origin in C to the n plus one, if you want to think of it as a module, I'm talking about the one-dimensional module you get by taking R and quotienting by the positive ideal. Right, that's a, that's a one-dimensional module. It's the skyscraper sheaf at the origin. If you restrict to the complement of the origin, that thing dies. It goes to zero. So if you've got a function with kernel, of course it's not fully faithful because what happened to the identity map on this guy? It went to zero. No good. Um, this has a very important implication about causal complexes. So again, I hope you've seen causal complexes a lot last week because you're gonna see them a lot again this week. So this guy, this point sheaf here, has a, has a graded or an equivariant causal resolution, which looks like this. Starts at O n minus one, and then you have a whole sequence in between whose ranks are binomial coefficients uh, going up to O minus one to the n plus one to O, and finally O zero at the end. Okay? So this is an exact sequence in the category of graded modules. When I restrict to projective space, this guy goes to zero, and therefore the remaining bit is exact, because restriction was an exact functor. So on Pn, we get an exact sequence of vector bundles. which I guess is something you saw last week, right? This exact sequence of vector bundles. For me, this exact sequence comes from the fact that it was the causal resolution of the origin, and you threw away the origin, and therefore you just have something that's exact. Now. Right, um, and of course, this exact sequence is the reason there's an extension group between this guy and this guy. Right, x n, the thing I just said was non-zero, counts exact sequences of length n, which are not trivial. This is a non-trivial such thing. That is, this is the class, this, this is the thing whose class in x n is, is the generator of that guy. Okay? So this non-vanishing of cohomology is exactly the same phenomenon as the functor having kernel. Things have gone to zero, that is what result, that is what causes sheaves to have cohomology. Right? Because, you, because something died. Okay, great. So I have convinced you, I hope, that this thing is not an equivalence. So what is the solution to this thing not being an equivalence? The solution is, do not think about this entire category. 
This entire category was very easy to work with, but it's not the same thing as this category. So what you have to do is focus your attention on a subcategory inside here, a piece of this category and not the whole thing. So I'm gonna tell you what subcategory to think about. Consider the following subcategory, which I'm gonna call W. It's gonna be the subcategory generated by a particular finite list of line bundles. Okay, so these are not line bundles on projective space at the moment. They are equivariant line bundles on CN plus one. They are just free graded R modules, if you like. Right, they are the things which you, I was also denoting by R, R1, and so on up to Rn. Okay? So these things are objects inside this category, so what I wanna think about is the subcategory that they generate. So I guess you've talked about, in fact, uh, Sasha was talking about it this morning as well, so I know that you've heard about it. Subcat su objects inside a triangulated category generating a subcategory. So these triangle brackets mean the triangulated subcategory generated by these objects. The smallest triangulated subcategory that contains all these objects. Um, another way to say it is that you can imagine taking just these line bundles and writing down chain complexes using just those line bundles. So maybe taking direct sums of them and then writing down maps between them and building yourself chain complexes. But you know, the chain complexes don't have arbitrary modules in them, right? They just have these modules in them and sums of them. And that will give you a whole bunch of objects inside this derived category. But it won't give you everything. Those are the objects I want. Right? So I'm looking at objects which are equivalent to chain complexes built from these line bundles. Okay, so this guy, as you may have guessed, is what I call a window. Do we have colors? We have colors. Which is actually an abuse of the, of the string theory terminology. For them, the window was something a little bit different. It was a region inside some particular parameter space, but anyway. So in mathematically, we, we abused the language and we ended up calling these subcategories windows instead. Um, okay, so this is the solution. Look at this window, and then I claim that this restriction functor, rho, as long as you only look at the subcategory w, it gives you a functor to the derived category of Pn, and that functor is an equivalence. So W is a category which is equivalent to the derived category of projective space. Okay? So this is this is the this is the point of this technique. Um, we're interested, fundamentally we're interested in this geometric derived category. We would like to work in this equivariant derived category because it's very straightforward. Sheets have no cohomology and life is easy. Um, so what we do is we find a way of embedding this category inside that category. You can think of this statement as saying there is a way to lift this category into the equivariant derived category. 
It gives you a section of this functor, right? This functor is not an equivalent, but of course, W embeds inside it because it's a subcategory. And this I'm claiming is an equivalent, so I can lift into W, right? It gives you a section of this functor, a partial inverse, right? Okay, so that's the claim. And hopefully you can see that I'm basically claiming Valenson's theorem here, right? This statement that W is an equivalence hopefully looks an awful lot like Valenson's theorem. Right? And it is. It is Valenson's theorem said in a different way. Um, what time am I finishing now? Quarter after. Cool. Okay, so I don't want to go into too much detail about the proof because you've seen the proof of Valenson's theorem. Um, but the proof is very easy. Um, so you just split it into two parts. We claim that this functor is fully faithful. Um, and then in a minute, we claim that it's essentially subjective. So it's fully faithful and it's essentially subjective, then it's an equivalent. So how do you prove this functor is fully faithful? Well, what's nice about this category W is it's defined explicitly by a bunch of generators. So all I have to do is look at my generating objects and make sure that the homomorphisms don't change when I apply this functor. Okay? So it's enough to check that rho star doesn't affect homs between any pair of generators. And when I say homs, I mean homs in the derived category, so really I mean x, right? Not just x0, but all the higher x as well. So how do we know this is true? Well, let me take oi and oj, two generators. So i and j are integers living in this interval that I specified 0 up to n. And first of all, let me look at the x groups between them inside the equivariant derived category. So in the equivariant derived category of the vector space, if I look at the x groups between OI and OJ. Well, as I was arguing before, it's just the cohomology of, of the line bundle OJ minus I. There is no higher cohomology, so you get zero if K is bigger than zero. Um, and if K is equal to zero, you're going to get just the graded piece of the ring R. You're going to get the polynomials of degree j minus i. All right, so that's zero unless j is bigger than i, of course. You saw it was a semi-orthogonal decomposition. There are no homomorphisms going from right to left. They're only going from left to right. Now let's take these 
things, these two generators, and restrict them to the complement of the origin, so now they become line bundles on projective space, and let's compute the X groups again. So now I'm talking about the cohomology on projective space of the line bundle O J minus I. And now we have to, we, now we have to worry a little bit, right? Because one thing I was highlighting earlier is of course on projective space, some line bundles do have cohomology, right? Previously I got the answer zero for all positive K. Here I should worry, right? Maybe this line bundle is really negative and, and, and that has cohomology. But it's not because I and J are in this interval. So the most negative that this guy could be is minus N. That's the smallest you can make that, minus N. So we, we're just okay. If we went to minus N minus one, we would pick up a cohomology group and it would go wrong, but we nailed it. We land just in that interval and we're okay. So we get exactly the same answer as we did above. And the crucial fact here is that J minus I is at least minus N. So if I'd made my window a tiny bit larger, let in the line bundle at the end, O N plus one, the theorem would fail. Okay? Um, what about the other half of the claim, the essential surjectivity? Well, this is something you've, I think you've seen, maybe even twice. So claim two is that this restriction functor from W to projective space is essentially subjective. So it hits every object, that's what I'm saying. So what I'm saying is if you take a, a chain complex just built out of the generators that I specified, it, you can hit every possible object in this category. So I'm saying every object in, in this derived category has a finite resolution by that set of line bundles. Any object in dbpn has a finite resolution by these line bundles. Okay, so maybe I don't want to labor that point because I, th I think you've seen it already, maybe twice. So we know that this is true. Um, the proof I prefer is to say, well, any object in here actually does come from the whole category. So this row star functor initially, it's not an equivalence, but it is essentially subjective. It hits absolutely everything. So maybe I need to write this down just very quickly. Um, so the original restriction functor is essentially subjective. Um, that's step one. Step two is that any object in here has a finite resolution by, line, by the OK line bundles. So let me say it this way. If I take, instead of taking the things in my window, what if I just take every possible line bundle, right? So all the graded free R modules, then they generate the entire equivariant derived category. 
So what I'm saying is that everything has a finite resolution by free graded modules. Um, that I did put as an exercise on, on the problem sheet. It's a little bit involved, so you maybe don't care about it, but if, you, if you're really interested in getting the proofs right, then that's one thing you have to check. Um, and then the third step is, is the thing which I think you've already set as an exercise, which is to say, well, okay, so I've got all of these line bundles, but I don't want to use all of the line bundles. I only want to use this finite subset. So what do you do? You use this exact sequence, which is written over here. What this exact sequence tells you is that when you have this set of line bundles, O all the way down to O minus N, you get an extra one on the end for free. Right? This guy lives in the subcategory generated by these guys. So if you do that infinitely many times, then you get from the finite window to everything. So step three is to use the long exact sequence. Okay. Cool. Wow. Yes, hopefully most of that you've sort of seen already. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm about to finish, but let me just make sort of a few more comments on it. Um, one thing just about terminology, I said this technique is called windows or grade restriction rules. So I've said the word window. Um, what was grade restriction rule? So the grade restriction rule is, is the statement that the line bundles that you're taking, the integers that I allowed into the definition of W, live inside this particular interval here. Right? The I and Js are the grades, and they have been restricted to living in this interval. So this is a grade restriction rule. Um, and the second comment is, um, as you've no doubt seen, there's nothing particularly special about choosing O up to ON. I could have started my collection at O1 and gone from O1 up to ON plus 1. Or I could have gone from O minus N up to O. Right? You can do it for any, any, uh, any translate of this set. So you could instead have defined your window to be the subcategory generated by OK up to OK plus N for any possible K and Z. So this thing we're doing of lifting the derived category of PN into this equivariant derived category, it's not unique, right? There are at least an integer's worth, a Z's worth of, of choices to be made, right? There may be others, right? I have not, I've not said that there aren't others. I don't know any others in this example, but in more complicated examples, that there are loads and loads of different possible choices. In this choice, there are, in this situation, there are at least this many choices to be made. Um, okay. Yeah, I should stop. So tomorrow we're going to run this arguments again, but for some more interesting examples than just projected space. Yes. Yes. It is admissible. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, there are different, the most sensible way to think about W. This is more detail than anyone except Nick cares about. The most sensible way to think about W is that it sits inside a three-term semi-orthogonal decomposition in the equivalent derived category with a whole bunch of stuff to its left and a whole bunch of stuff to its right. Um, but you can just think of it as sitting on the left with some orthogonal on the right, or you can put it on the right with some orthogonal on the left. You have these choices. Um, and I guess I should also say I have some exercises for you guys to do. Um, um, today, probably only one, two, and three are relevant, but you could, you could start having a look at the other ones if you want to. That'll be covered tomorrow, Mark.